All right, the other was more chapter four, part two, and this is from the perspective of the U.S. one. Leave the smack and the crack for the whack, or the vial and the nine, keep a smile like that. My eyes were closed and my hands moved along with the beat, as if I were on stage laying on the tracks on a DJ set. I was in a zone, concert mode, even if I was only in the front seat of my mother's blue Honda Civic. I recited a verse from the Chub Rock song that blared out of the car speakers. The road lost my mom's full attention. The road lost my mother's full attention momentarily. She stared down at me. She looked incredulous. After a series of unsatisfactory report cards, my mother began to think that what many of my teachers were telling her was correct. I might have a learning disability. My teachers broke it down for her more than once. Wes is a nice boy, but he has real problems retaining information. She remembered this as she listened to me reciting lyrics like I'd written them myself. Anyway, the shunless one brings forth the fun. No hatred. The summer's almost done. How long have you known that song? I don't know, not long, I mumbled out, lazily opening my eyes, but never picking my head up to look at my mother. I had first heard the song two days earlier. Well, your grades obviously aren't bad because you can't pick this stuff up or because you're stupid. You're just not working hard enough, my mother said, her voice rising into the epiphany. My academic failures had forced her to go through the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. She had been stuck in depression for a long time and hadn't quite made it to acceptance, no matter how much I'd hoped she'd get there. It seemed like there's fault, faulty wiring in the system, because now she's reverting to anger. You think I'm playing? Just try me, she said, the last note in a short conversation she seemed to be having with herself, and then returned her full attention to the road. As she did so, the new EPMD song came on. She must have noticed my slight head nod to the beat, because she quickly killed the radio. Hip-hop had begun to play a special role in my life. It wasn't just music and lyrics. It was a validator. In my struggle to reconcile my two worlds, it was an essential asset. By the late 1980s, hip-hop had graduated from being the underground art of the Bronx to a rising global culture. My obsession with hip-hop kept me credible with the kids in my neighborhood. I let them know that, that regardless of my school affiliation, I still understood. Hip-hop also gave the kids in my school a point of entry into my life. Public Enemies, Black Nationalist Anthems, or KRS-1's pulpy fantasies about gunning down crack dealers, offered a window into a world that before hip-hop had seemed foreign to those who even dared to look through. But even more than that, I found in hip-hop the sound of my generation talking to itself, working through the fears and anxieties and inco-hate dreams of wealth or power, revolution or success. We all shared. It broadcast an exaggerated version of our complicated interior lives to the world, it made us feel less alone in the madness of the era, less marginal. Of course, all that didn't matter to my mother. All she knew is I could effortlessly recite hip-hop lyrics while struggling with my English class. What she didn't know was that my problem in school was much more basic than a learning disability. The problem was that I wasn't even showing up half the time. It's tough to do well in school as an 11-year-old when you're picking and choosing which days to go. It was weeks before sorry, I had my schedule down pat. I realized the only time anyone really cared about my attendance was during homeroom, the first class of the day. Two days of the week, I had homeroom with my English teacher, Mrs. Downs, a young blonde who taught only one other class in her life. I sensed her weakness and spent most of my class coming with creative ways to burnish my status as class clown. One day, she flatly told me that it didn't matter to her if I showed up because class ran smoother when I wasn't there. From that moment, I understood Mrs. Downs, and I had an unspoken agreement, a don't ask, don't tell pact that worked like a charm for both of us. Here's how a typical day would go. My grandmother would drop Shawnee and me off at school or at the train stop, and we would wave goodbye book bags in hands and smiles on faces. We would turn around and begin marching toward the school building or train stop until my grandmother's car pulled away. At that point, I'd have to decide how I'd play it. Some days I'd check into home room. Other days I'd head directly back to the train and return to the neighborhood where I'd meet up with one of the guys who had a similar arrangement. My sister, always the loyal accomplice, never snitched. With my mother working so much and her grandparents obviously slowing in energy, my sisters and I were supposed to look after one another. Nikki was older, so she was always the one looking after me, and it was my responsibility to look after Shawnee. But Nikki's hands were full with her own turbulent high school experience, experience, which was about to come to a close. The move to the Bronx had been hard on her. Nikki never had fully adjusted to the new social and academic environment. She attended three different high schools in four years. Shawnee, by contrast, was a prodigy. She did not go outside much except to play basketball with me and my friends, and she seemed to have a book with her wherever she went. In fact, by the time I hit fifth grade and she was in third grade, she had overtaken me in reading scores, a distinction she carried through our entire academic lives and probably holds to this day. As much of a screw-up as I was becoming, I still tried hard to look after her. 
A few months later, Shawnee went out to play with one of the neighborhood girls, Letitia, and came back home with her face covered in blood. When I returned home later that day, she was sitting on the couch in the living room, a red stained napkin stuck in one of her nostrils, and my grandmother's arms wrapped around her shoulders. They told me what had happened. Shawnee, Letitia, and a Puerto Rican girl named Ingrid were jumping rope outside the house. A dispute broke out, words were exchanged, and Shawnee found herself on the receiving end of a punch to the nose. Shawnee was much bigger than the other girl and was used to wrestling with me, but didn't fight back. She just started crying and headed into the house, pinching her nose to stop the bleeding. By the end of the story, I was furious. First, at Shawnee for not punching Letitia back, but then at Letitia, who had the audacity to go after my sister. Just recently off my first encounter with the movie The Godfather, I pulled a Sonny Carl Corleone. I got that pronunciation right, and flew out the door to find Letitia. My actual godmother, who was standing by the door, also wanted done the action. Aunt BB, a tall, light-skinned Alabamian who had known my grandparents since she moved up to New York 30 years ago, was one of our family's fiercest defenders, and she was not going to let me go out there to avenge my sister without her being there. She'd also just moved into the house with us, making it eight of us in our small row home. Just as fired up as I was, Aunt BB followed me up the street. In retrospect, we made a comical pair of enforcers, a 40-something-year-old woman trailing an 11-year-old boy, but we were deadly serious. When we rolled up to her house, Letitia was sitting on the front steps with her older brother. She straightened up with a surprised look. Aunt BB demanded to know why she'd hit Shawnee. Letitia stumbled through an answer, claiming she was defending herself. Aunt BB cut her off. Little girl, don't you ever touch her again. I don't know who you think you are, but you were really messing with the wrong one. Letitia stared back. She was too cool to show submission and too scared to show defiance. As we started to walk away, I decided I could not let my aunt handle the fight alone. Solo, so I turned around and faced Letitia while keeping an eye on her older brother. And let me tell you, I said, if I ever hear you about touching her again, the last thing you'll have to worry about is a bloody nose. Not only was her brother older and bigger, but he had a rep as one not to be played with. But I just stood there in my b-boy stance, empowered by strains of the bridges over running through my head, until I felt like the message had gotten across. Satisfied, Aunt BB and I took off for her house. I was a little shaken as we walked back home in the twilight. Little things like this had a way of escalating into blood feuds. Big brothers called bigger brothers, who called crews. But Shawnee never played with Letitia again, and fortunately, I never saw her brother again. The Bronx streets had become a fixture in my life. Whether it was playing ball at Gun Hill Projects basketball court, heading over to Three Boys on Berkey Avenue to get a slice of pizza, running to Solace to get an edge up on Bronxwood, or just sprawling out on stoops with my crew, some of the most important lessons I learned, I learned from these streets. I learned about girls getting periods not from biology class, but from my friend Paris. I learned the realities of gang violence not from after-school specials, but when my boy Mark got jumped and beaten down for wearing the wrong color jacket. And I learned that cops are smarter than I thought in the corner of Laconia Avenue. I was rocking my Olaf's basketball shorts and Syracuse t-shirt on an unseasonably warm Saturday in October. I'd always wanted to go to Syracuse, like my Uncle Howard, and play basketball for the Orange Men. I was to find out later that I wanted them a whole lot more than they wanted me. We just finished playing a game of basketball and were leaving the courts when out of the corner of my eye, I saw Shia, or Shay, Shia, Shay, one of my friends from the neighborhood. Shay was my age, but shorter, with reddish hair and light skin, light enough for a spray of freckles to shine through. I broke off from my friends and walked over to him. Shia, Shay, we're going to call him Shay. She, Shay, Shay. We met halfway and greeted each other. I asked him what he was up to, and he said confidently, nothing, just finished working. I checked out his gear, black jeans, a white tank top, and a black backpack. Work. I knew exactly what that meant. Shay was a runner. <coughs> Excuse me. An entry-level position in any drug enterprise. A runner was the one who moved packages for local suppliers who needed to make drop-offs for the street-level dealers, but didn't want to carry the weight themselves. Kids like Shay were used, because they were less conspicuous and less likely to be stopped by police officers. Shay was making decent money, but ever since he started working, we'd seen less of him. Shay and I sat in front of the Q Lounge, a bar and billiards club whose facade was painted black. The Q Lounge sat next to a Kentucky Fried Chicken and an hourly rate motel. Cars were by as we spoke. We were checking out the black wall of the lounge with his plaster with spray painted tags. Some we recognized as friends we knew, and others from around from other walls around the neighborhood. It seemed as if everybody in the hood had their own nickname and tag, some more elaborate than others, even me. Mine was simple, a KK with a circle around it, standing for Kid K Cupid, an alter ego I assumed to, ad assumed to advertise my largely imaginary prowess with the young ladies. I had redecorated a few corners of the Bronx with it. As we stared at the markups on the wall admiring the work of some of our contemporaries, Shay reached over his shoulder 
pulled out, pulled the backpack in front of him and slowly unzipped it. I quickly looked inside. Beside a small bottle of water and a white headband were two spray paint bottles, one with a white top and one with a blue. He looked at me with a sly smirk. You want a tag? I couldn't say no. First off, Shay was one of the most respected young hustlers in the neighborhood. He was a worker. We all knew that. And while some of the kids were smart enough to be disgusted by what he did, other kids, even the ones who weren't in the game, respected his position. Plus, I loved throwing my name up on a wall. I felt like splashing in the shallow end of the criminal pool. Oh, he's so cool. I scanned the streets for cops and nosy neighbors as I reached into his bag and pulled out a can with a white top. My eyes continued to scan as I shook the can, making sure the contents were mixed so the paint would come out even and clean, creating a crisp result. Once I felt the coast was clear, I began first drawing the connected Ks and finished with a wide circle around them. My custom style. I placed the can back in Shay's bag, satisfied with my work and our speed. Seven seconds and done. I had added my indelible mark to Lacona Avenue, a testament to the world that Wes Moore lived, or at least Kid Cupid did. Nobody could ever deny I was there, not even me as a police cruiser rolled up around the corner. Wop, wop. That is not how a police siren sounds, but I'm not going to imitate that noise. The distinctive sound of a police siren right now. Shay and I looked at each other and sprinted off in different directions. Foolishly, I headed right past the police car. It took one of the officers seconds to wrap me up and throw me against his vehicle. Shay at least had a shot. I saw him sprinting off in the opposite direction. He turned around, saw me being patted down, and realized my escape had lasted a mere four seconds. He tried to speed up, but the seconds later, he too was wrapped up by a policeman. As I lay on the hood of the, hood of the car, with the officer's hands pressing against every part of me searching me, I watched Shay twenty feet away on the ground, getting the same treatment. My uncertainty about what to expect ended when the officer reached above my head and began to pull my left arm behind my back. Now I understood where this was going. I was being arrested. Chill, man, I didn't do anything, I began screaming as I tried to wrangle my hands free. Stop resisting, the officer warned as he cuffed my left wrist and roughly pinned down my flailing right arm. The relationship between the police and the people they served and protected changed significantly during the 1980s. For almost as long as black folks have been in this country, they've had a complicated relationship with law enforcement, and vice versa. But the situation in the 80s felt like a new low. Drugs had brought fear to both sides of the equation. You could see it in the people in the neighborhood. Intimidated by the drug dealers and gangs, harassed by the petty crime of the crackheads, and frightened by the sometimes arbitrary and aggressive behavior of the cops themselves. On the other end of the relationship, the job of policemen, almost overnight, had gotten significantly tougher. A tide of drugs was matched by a tide of guns. The high-stakes crack trade brought a new level of competition and organization to the streets. From my supine perch on the back of the police car, I noticed an older woman staring at me, shaking her head. After he finished cuffing me, the cop opened the rear door of his cruiser and pushed my head down while shoving me in the back seat. I was terrified. I had no idea what was next. I thought raced around my head. My mother was going to have to pick me up from jail. She had just finished talking about my grades, and now this? My relationship with my mother was in a strange place. My desperation for her support was in constant tension with my desperation for independence and freedom. I projected apathy about her feelings, but I wanted nothing more than to make her proud. In other words, I was a teenager, deathly fearful of disappointing her, but too prideful to act like it mattered. Now I was afraid this incident might turn my only stalwart supporter against me. Loneliness enveloped me. I felt my fate suddenly tw- twined with that of Shay, an aspiring drug dealer who I didn't really give a damn about me. My friends seemed far away, and in that distance I became aware of the contingent nature of my relationship with my crew. We loved one another, but how long would we mourn the absence of any one of us? I'd seen it happen a million times already. Kids caught out there in one way or another, killed, imprisoned, shipped off to distant relatives. The older kids would part a little liquor or leave a shrine in a corner under a graffiti mur- mural. Or they'd reminisce about the ones who were locked down. But then life went on. The struggle went on. Who really cared? Besides my mother, who would even miss me? 